Welcome to another edition of Success Talk. This is Dr. Herbert Harris with another interesting, incredible personality. Someone who has accomplished great things, overcome great challenges, and made breakthroughs to be successful no matter what. Today we have my, my friend, Veronica Carter. Welcome to Success Talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Harris. It's my honor and pleasure to be here with you. Well, you know, Veronica, I love to talk with I, 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 the, the word politician is just, uh, is it, what's a better word? Uh, <laughs> elected official. Elected, elected official. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, more, more representative. The people yeah. actually, my neighbors actually thought enough of me to elect me to represent them. So Okay, so an elected representative. But, you know, in this time, in these times, it is so refreshing to talk to an elected representative who seems to be concerned about the people and what's going on. I I try, but you know that's just who I I am. It's it's um, how I was raised, and um, a lot of people ask me over the years why I do the things I do. It's it's part of my my being. My faith it tells me to act a certain way and treat people the way I would want to be treated. So to me, it's just I hope second nature. Mm, mm. Now, did you did you in your early years did you ever think of yourself as a as a as an elected official? Was that a goal oh. of yours? No, no, not by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. I um, I think as a kid, I wanted to be a lawyer, just like you. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah. I was fascinated by the law. I grew up in the 60s in New York City where there was a lot going on back mm -hmm. then, you know, with the civil rights movement. Yeah. And, I, and a lot of laws were being passed at the federal level. And I began to realize that the laws and laws in general could change people's lives. They could mm -hmm. make people's lives better. Yes. Or they could adjust injustices. Um, and so the, I thought that, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to help people. I want to be a lawyer. I want to right wrongs. I you know, felt like Superwoman or something. I want to go out and do all these great things. And I was always fascinated by history and mm. politics and political science and current events and how government worked. Um, when my parents passed away and I cleaned out the, their their apartment and house and stuff, I found old newspaper clippings, I'd kind of forgotten that I actually in the sixth grade was on a model city council. Wow. Um, <laughs> go figure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and But I wasn't on the council. I actually was, um, of all things, I was the union rep who was testifying to the city council. Mm -hmm. So I was the activist first, which mm -hmm. is about right the way my life worked out. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Now tell us a little about your early years. You grew up in New York. I did. I'm a native New Yorker. I uh, grew up in Brooklyn. A proud graduate of uh, New York City Public Schools. Uh, went to PS91 in uh, Crown Heights. I went to uh, Meyer Levin Junior High School, 285 in East Flatbush, and then uh, Samuel J. Tilden High School, also in East Flatbush. Yeah. And when I was uh, at Tilden, I was at a magnet school for the School of Law, Politics, and Community Affairs. And, you know, in New York City, high schools are the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Yeah. And so in those three years, we uh, took the equivalent of seven years of social studies. Wow. And so I got to take classes in intro to political science, constitutional law. So, again, you know, that whole I want to be a lawyer. Um, uh, I, I sometimes think about the fact that there I was in high school doing law, politics and community affairs. Well, I've done all those things now in my life. So um, who knew that it, who it was knew? all part of. Yeah, it was all part of the prep to get me ready. Yeah. Um, so. Wow. But you know what? It, it's so important. Many times those experiences as a as a child in, in middle school, in junior high, and even in high school have a way of framing your entire life. You know, and, uh, very often I, I've interviewed many, many people and very often that spark was right there in those in that period. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, besides being the civil rights movement, you know, in the 70s, we got into the feminist movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm an only child. And so I, my father worked two jobs. So uh, during the weekdays, I was with my mother a lot. And I think my mother had a lot more activists in her than she wanted to admit. She was very ladylike. And, and sometimes I think she despaired about the fact that her daughter was so pushy and forward and um, spoke <laughs> her mind and all that. Uh -huh. um, later on in life, my mother became a lot more. I, I think I really get this from my mother. I just 
I wasn't afraid to show it. Yeah. <laughs> and then later, later in her life, she started showing it. And I kept kind of looking at her like, who are you again? Are you my mom? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I was happy to see it, but it was just kind of funny. But um, in the seventies, you know, we got into feminism and in New York, a lot of uh, women politicians were being elected. You had Bella Abza, you had Shirley Chisholm. Yeah. Um, my congresswoman was Elizabeth Holtzman. I've and so, yeah. um, and she came to my sixth grade class and spoke yeah. to us. Wow. And so I, I was just absolutely fascinated by the fact that, you know, here were these women and you, know, you didn't see a lot of women in politics right. back then, regardless, yeah. especially on the national uh -huh. level. Yeah. And you didn't see a lot of women in charge of things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they were always the secretary or the uh, administrative assistant or they were doing all the work. They yeah. just weren't getting paid and they weren't getting to to be the boss. Yeah. That and so the fact that, yeah. And so the fact that you could see these women um, on television and it really came to light during the Watergate hearings. Yeah. You know, that's when you, you got Barbara Jordan yes. out there along with Bella Abzug and Elizabeth Holtzman. And you could watch them make uh, grown men squirm in their seats. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this whole idea of law and, 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 uh, making things right just really started to fascinate me. Wow. So I made up my mind I was going to go to college and major in political science. And my goal was to uh, graduate from undergraduate and then go to law school. Uh -huh. But um, I had been uh, kind of on a fast pace in my academic career up until that point. I was accelerated in um, public schools. And so uh, I actually graduated at 16. And so by the time I hit 20, I was uh, kind of bordering on being burnt out. Mm -hmm. um, and I, in college, had decided I needed a way to make more money. I didn't want my parents, my parents had made me, even though I was an only child, responsible enough to know that I needed to, like, have my own. I needed yeah. to pull my own weight. And, you know, I had some academic scholarships and, and they had some money saved up. And so I was very fortunate, never had college loans. But I was like, well, how am I going to pay for this law school thing? This sounds right. expensive. Yeah, And I want to be able to be on my own and show them I'm self-sufficient. And I thought about joining the reserves um, and making some extra money on the weekends. And I had an uncle who was in the army and it, I always thought that was kind of cool. And um, more women were being recruited into the army. And the cool thing about being in the army as a woman was that people had to salute you. It didn't matter what sex you were. Yeah, And theoretically, it didn't matter what race you were. You yeah. know, the army had been integrated for a long time. It was kind of like yeah. the great equalizer. Yeah. And when I went to college, um, the college I went to happened to have an Army ROTC program in it. So mm -hmm. before I ever stepped foot on campus, I got this little card in the mail that said, hey, you could be a second lieutenant. And um, I was a little smarter than the average bear and said, well, it makes more sense to go in as a lieutenant than it does as a private. Yeah. So maybe I ought to go learn more about this ROTC thing uh -huh. and see what they can offer me. And I went uh, I joined ROTC as a freshman. Went on my first camping trip or bivouac. Uh -huh. My mother thought, you know, this is a native New York kid from Crown Heights, Brooklyn, who lived uh -huh. in a four-story walk-up. Yeah. And it was a miserable uh -huh. weekend. It rained the whole weekend. It was absolutely uh -huh. miserable. And my mother just knew, she told me years later that when I got off the bus soaking wet, that it was like going to be, okay, I'm done. Uh -huh. And I was like, that was the best time I've <laughs> ever had. So much fun. We marched. We uh -huh. did this. Yes, and yes. and I was hooked. I was hooked yes. from on, and so um, and there were you know women, young cadets. Obviously, we didn't have any female cadre or instructors, but we had you know upper level women who were seniors and juniors and sophomores who yes. were in the cadet chain of command, and I was watching them again lead and yes. be in charge. And something yes. sparked in me like this whole being in charge and leadership yes. and yes. how do you manage people? And, and yes. it just all clicked. And so I ended up obviously not going to law school, but joining the army. Wow. Going active duty when I, I graduated. Now, yes. when I graduated, I still, still was kind of holding on to that. I'll go, I'll, I'll serve three or four years, get some experience under my belt and maybe let the army help pay for law school, get fully right. funded law school something right. but the more i stayed in and did things the more i realized i was never going to law school <laughs> right, and i right, really enjoyed right. what i was so. You're doing wow now that's amazing you know that, that when you can find that um and now where did you go to college 
I went to Fordham University, Fordham. which is okay. a, one of the 28 Jesuit universities in the United yes. States. Yes. Um, I am not yeah. Catholic, but uh -huh. um, the Jesuits have a very interesting, they're the Catholic Church's educators, and uh -huh. they have something that they call cura personalis, which means that they they believe that if you're truly an educated person, you are a well-rounded and educated person and that you care yes. for more than just yourself. Yes. And so um, they tend to have very intensive curriculum requirements and be very rigid. Um, I, I tell people all the time, like when I went to college some 40 years ago, there were about five to 6% African-Americans. I ended up going back to Fordham and being in charge of the Army ROTC program at about wow. my 15th year of uh, active duty. And they still had about five to six percent African American. They hadn't really increased. They've yeah. done a little bit better since uh, since that time, but yeah, um, they held their line. Like, okay, yeah. these are our requirements, yeah. and you got to make got to make the requirements. We're gonna help you, but you got to make the requirements. Yeah. So, well, well, you know, Veronica, it's interesting because there's this movement now I've seen where so many uh, a number of major corporations are eliminating the requirements for college education. Right. And uh, there's this focus now on more of a trade school type mentality. Go learn something that's useful. Go learn something right. that you do. And as you were talking about the Jesuit concept of a rounded individual, or, or, mm -hmm. or I'll call it a world thinker, a person who has uh, problem just... solving, decision making skills. Correct. Yeah. 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 And uh, I, you know, I wonder, you know, I, how that's going to work out in the long term, you know, because. Well, you know, I, I will tell you, especially having been in the Army, college is not for everyone. Yeah. Um, it, it really isn't. Let's just face it. And, yeah. they, and and Lord knows you don't want me to work on your car or your, you know, or your dishwasher or anything else. Yeah. Um, so there are people who we need and have trade and have just as that knack for public service. I discovered that little light. There are yes. people who have that knack for the trades and we need those people. Yeah. And Lord knows we need, especially when something breaks down, Lord knows yeah. I need those people. Yeah. So um, I, I get it. But college, uh, I've never heard anyone who graduated from college say, gee, I, that what a waste of time that was. Um, yeah. I, I think in the long run, most people, as they get older and a little bit more mature, um, realize that the time they spent there hopefully helped them. Yeah. Um, it may not have been their major that helped them. But just that experience in the maturation process of having to grow up and learn how to deal with other people and other types of people and learn how to think. Yeah. I mean, that's I, I left classes as an undergraduate at Fordham where I literally had to go to the cafeteria and have a cup of coffee because I was tired because the professor yeah. challenged me. You know, yeah. he made me think. Yeah. And uh, th th there's an old expression that, you know, nothing hurts a person more than to make them think. Um, <laughs> but it's important. Yeah. It's important, yeah. you know, having being able to. I've, I've run into many people over the years now that I wonder, well, what kind of school did you go to? Because, yeah. you know, yeah. maybe your reasoning um, for you, one plus one equals 11. I'm not quite yeah. sure how you got there. I could see there was some a thought process there, but it ended up all wrong. Oh, wow. um, so yeah. I, I think it's an important thing. But again, college is not for everyone. And, yeah. and, and, and it's and not guess, for you. Yeah. I'd rather people drop out rather than yeah. waste the time and the money, particularly yeah. if it's your parents' time and money. Yeah. And I guess it's a balance, you know, it's like everybody has a role every, you know, when we look at how the, the world is created, the, you know, birds have a purpose, lions have a purpose, mm -hmm. everything has a purpose. And so, you know, I think, I, you know, I, I, I'll tell you that. a little story. I, I, mm -hmm. I had a cousin that was having some issues in life mm -hmm. and my mother's like, you need to talk to him and make him join the military. And I'm like, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. I said, cause we'll do, he'll end up getting put out. Mm -hmm. I said, he'll be one of those folks that will end up chaptering out of the army. So he, I said, he's got issues. He's not ready. He's not mature. He's not listening to people. He's not going to take orders. He's, you know, I don't know what he needs, but it, it's not the army right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, like you say, everyone has their purpose in life and you've got to hopefully find that purpose, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and hopefully have people along the way that'll give you the freedom to find it. I had been in the army 15 years before I learned my mother didn't want me to join the army. Really? And, and Yeah. And I praise her for that. You know, yeah. and I remember looking yeah. at her saying, isn't it a little late for you to tell me now that you didn't want yeah. me to join? She said, yeah. well, I was hoping, and, and she told me, she said, I was hoping that day you came back soaking wet, you were just going to like quit. Yeah. And she said, when you didn't and were enthusiastic about it, I realized I needed to let you find your own way. Yeah. 
and, and that's, you know, your mother had great insight because so many times parents try to mold children, you know, like all the things that they didn't do or didn't have, they right. want the children to fulfill their dreams. So that was beautiful. But, it, it was. Yeah. And it, and I was blessed to, to yeah. have the, the parents that I had and, and for them to be as wise as they were. Yeah. But, well, you know, my dad never served in the army and he got, technically he got drafted. And uh, this is, I guess, uh, the beginning of early World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said in the days of segregation, he went down to, he, he was supposed to pick you up. He was go down to the post office and sign in and the bus took you wherever they trained you. And he said he got down there and there were so many white guys, they didn't have a seat for him on the bus. So... <laughs> They sent him away. <laughs> Some things are meant to be. <laughs> so he, he never went back and they never came looking for him. One of the few times segregation might have worked out in his favor. So, you know. But he had a story. He he told a story. He said, you know about old Jimmy, Jimmy Lee. I said, no. I said, Jimmy Lee went into the service. Yeah. And he said he got in the service and Jimmy Lee walked around and every, he saw people, a piece of paper on the ground. He'd pick it up and turn it over. He would go in the, the library and he'd see paper. He'd pick it up and turn it over. And he said they watched Jimmy Lee for about six weeks. They said, this guy is crazy. There's something wrong with him. And so finally the uh, commander called him in and you know, they said, well, Jimmy Lee says, um, we're going to have to discharge you. And he puts the papers on the table and, and Jimmy Lee picks it up and Lurk turns over. He said, that's it. That's what I've been looking for. <laughs> Good story. <laughs> oh, my oh. goodness. Yeah. Now, as a lady in the Army, what were some of the challenges you faced in the Army? Well, it, you know, it was a, a twofer because I not only was I a woman, but I was a black woman. Yes. And you can almost throw in the third part. I was a black woman from New York mm. and yeah, and I was in the office of poor, you know, traditionally African-Americans served as enlisted people. Even in the, the segregated units, the officers would be white yes. and all of the enlisted folks would be would be black. And so to see a black officer in 1981 was not something it was kind of a rare commodity. And to see a black female. Yeah, um, was even you know so there was a, like almost like a cohort group of us who were learning as we went along. Um, I think the army caused me to make friends with people I probably would not normally have made friends with, mm. but they were the only other black women there. Yeah, and we just knew that we needed to like try to stay together, uh -huh. whether we liked each other or not or had anything in common other than being black women, uh -huh. because nobody else was going to look out for us. Um, there were men who thought we didn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. And they were going to do everything in their power to ensure that we weren't. Uh, some of those were white men. Some of those were black men. Mm -hmm. um, there were not that many women that were um, over us. The, the, you, you might remember the term WAC, the Women yeah. Army Corps. Yeah. The, women, the WACs were dissolved in 1979 and mm -hmm. integrated fully into the Army. I was commissioned in 1981, just two years later. The first female graduated from West Point in 1980. And so these were years that the, the Corps, the Army's officer corps, was being integrated again, this mm -hmm. time with sex yeah. as opposed to race. Um, I think, and it's been 40 years now, more than 40 years, I think when I first went in, there was probably about 14% African-American uh, Black officers in the entire Army. Mm -hmm. Um, and so to see again, and that's across the board. And obviously, the higher up you get, the fewer you black did. officers. That yeah, the fewer yeah. there will be uh, between. And I remember once being a lieutenant, um, and I was an ordnance officer. That's the ordnance corps uh, crest behind my um, my right shoulder. Uh -huh. And um, and I was at a, uh, a a conference. I was serving as like an aide during this conference at Aberdeen Proving Ground. And they threw up a slide that said that the highest rank in the Ordnance Corps of a women officer was Lieutenant Colonel. Uh -huh. And there were only three of them. And this was probably 1982 or so. Uh -huh. And I turned to a, a female captain and said, is that right? Uh -huh. There's only three like, you know, and she said, yeah, and two of them are idiots. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I went, wow. okay. 
Um, yeah. So um, I remember being a, a, a black female major uh, towards the end of my career. Mm -hmm. And in my branch in the army, and this was an army of about 700,000 active duty soldiers. I was one of 69 women in my rank, wow. in my branch, in the entire United States Army. Wow. Now, and so those kind of, uh, yeah, those kind of numbers, are, you know, I, I'm so happy and proud to see as many young gifted in black women um, in the officer corps, regardless of the branch of service they're in now. Yeah. And, and just know that maybe some of the, the nonsense I went through helped them get where they are today. So, yeah. um, and there was a lot of gains and a lot of uh, folks who did everything in their power to make it as miserable as possible to try to get you to quit. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, I was reading a piece about the Mumford Point Marines and the guy was saying that, he said they, they went out of their way to make it mm -hmm. miserable and terrible because if they can make you quit, then they can say, aha, you weren't qualified anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and so, and it's much harder to, you know, it, it's been my experience. I've actually put in my, my uh, resignation. When you are a commissioned officer, you get a commission from Congress. And so you actually have to resign your commission. Mm -hmm. um, and I've actually resigned twice in the military. Wow. Wow. Um, obviously, it did not go through. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but um, the first time was for principal. Mm -hmm. And I was per perfectly prepared to leave the military at that point. And I, uh, an officer whose name I do not know to this day uh -huh. saw my resignation. The second paragraph in your resignation letter is reason for resigning. And I, I unloaded. I told exactly why I was leaving. And he read it and he was at a personnel level, higher levels above me at the general mm -hmm. officer staff level and said, why are you doing this? He called me and he said, I got your resignation letter here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've also been accepted to be a commander mm -hmm. for two different units. That's never happened before because why are you resigning? Mm -hmm. I said, well, you have my resignation letter. He said, yeah, what is going on? He said, no, no, don't tell me the, he said, give me the real story here. He said, uh -huh. He said, because I'm actually about to go into the three stars office and bring this to his attention. Uh -huh. This guy didn't have to do this because this was a white officer, a white male uh -huh. officer. He didn't have to do that. Uh -huh. um, but he he kind of restored my faith in the army because I'm like, I believe that this service and that the army was something that it was. It didn't matter what color you were. It didn't uh -huh. matter what sex you were. We were all supposed to be soldiers, soldiers uh -huh. first. And the fact that he saw something that he thought was a mistake, that he thought was wrong and, and intervened. Mm -hmm. without knowing me yeah um kind of restored my faith in the system and obviously mm -hmm. i'm still here so mm -hmm. my faith was further restored in the system mm -hmm. because um mm -hmm. things worked out yeah but yeah. um it was incidents like that where uh, folks would step up and do the right thing for the right reasons i had bosses who were just total um i i don't even know a good way of putting it they, they were not nice not nice people let's just call it that way uh -huh. and then i had guys who who had my back yeah. just totally had my back and um i had female folks in my chain of command who literally when things got tough were crossing the street so they wouldn't even have to be seen with me because uh -huh. they didn't want their careers to be impacted but again i've had males white males step uh -huh. up and and do the right thing and so uh -huh. I've tried to be uh, a mentor to uh, officers that I came, you know, that were subordinate to me. I'm mm -hmm. proud to say I have a number of officers who technically outrank me now. They don't technically, mm -hmm. they do outrank me right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important that these were young officers who had a black woman as their boss mm -hmm. and saw it, just saw it as a natural mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. a big deal. Uh, it wasn't something extraordinary and that they thought enough of me to keep in touch with me throughout their careers. Um, I've got some of them that are still in touch with me and I'm really honored by the fact that they would still want to talk to me and seek me out. Mm. So um, that's an impact yeah. that you just can't really measure. Yeah. Well, a couple of things. One, you mentioned ordinance. So for a lot of our young people, they don't have a clue. What is ordinance? So you notice the bomb and the uh, cross can is behind me. So uh -huh. ordinance, most people think of as ammunition, you know, uh -huh. bombs, bullets, et cetera. But in the army, ordinance is also maintenance management and something called life cycle management. So it's more logistics. It's uh, making sure that from the time a piece of equipment 
is accepted into the army inventory, whether it be a handgun or whether it be a howitzer, like on the, the uh, cannons that behind me, mm-hmm. or whether it be a, um, a tank, an M1 tank, mm-hmm. it has to be maintained. It has to be, you know, you have, you need mechanics. You need, there are all kinds of different systems on it from uh, the uh, turret down to the tracks, uh, to the different electric, electrical systems that go in it. Those are all mechanics. Those are all soldiers that are ordnance soldiers. Mm. They're trained at by the ordnance corps. All of the mechanics in the military are ordnance soldiers. Okay. And so I was a maintenance company commander. Mm. Um, so I had a bunch of mechanics under me, but I also had supply folks because you can't fix it if you don't have the repair part. Wow. So, um, you know, you have you do supply chain management sometimes, although it's in the quartermaster branch, mm-hmm. class nine, which is repair parts is uh, emphasized in the ordinance court because again if it's broke and you need a repair part you got to know how to go get the repair part legally and so that is ordinance and it led to me becoming a, a logistics a logistician mm-hmm. um, because now we actually have a logistics branch where the quartermaster corps the transportation corps and the ordinance corps as the officers progress throughout their careers we used to call it being a multifunctional logistician. You got to okay. a certain point, you got that designation because you did jobs in other branches. Even though you were ordinance, you may, I've had jobs where I sh- technically should have been a quartermaster officer or a supply mm-hmm. officer, but they, they merged together because of the experience I had. They felt I was a better fit for that position. Yeah. Now there's actually a logistics branch where they train officers in the different, they start off in their primary mm-hmm. branches, then become a logistics officer. But yeah. logistics is a wonderful field because it's it's uh, transferable. It's a very transferable well, skill. Well, to that's be, what, yeah, that's know, what I was thinking Supply about. chain man, you know, yeah. supply yeah. chain management at Sears or at Sam's Club or at Walmart is kind yeah. of the same principle, whether you're yeah. in the military or whether you're working for a Fortune 500 company. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, it's a great, as, as, as you were talking, I mean, that's one of those skills – you might not translate some of the shooting skills other than become a mm-hmm. police officer, but that's one of those skills that can really be ma- learned and mastered in the military that you can transfer out and be and quite it, good at in, it because, yeah. It's, quite, it's, it's incredibly marketable for your future yeah. life. As I used to yeah. tell some of my younger soldiers, one day you will leave the military. You will yeah. either uh, retire if you spend enough time or you'll decide it's time for me to leave, or the army may decide it's time for you to leave and you'll leave hopefully on yeah. good terms, yeah. or you'll die on active duty. Yeah. But one day you will you yeah. will, you will leave this. And yeah. the question is, what are you gonna do when you leave? Yeah, beautiful. Now, just, you, know, you may or may not be able, is there any specific instance? Because a lot of times people don't, when we talk about some of the challenges in the military, I interviewed a couple of old soldiers from the Mumford Point bunch. And some of the stuff they shared, it's like people actually did that to other people. Is there anything like that that you could share that maybe you had to overcome, you know, one of those kind of specific things that folks might be able to say, man, people, that really happened? Yes. Yeah. Um, You know, I told you I resigned. Um, I, I, when you're an officer, you have to have certain jobs, just Mm -hmm. like in the civilian world, in order to progress to the next rank. And one of the things you have to do is be a company commander. Well, uh, when I was uh, stationed at Fort Lewis, I had a company command, or excuse me, a group commander, an 06 full bird colonel, Mm -hmm. who had been a um, 1964 graduate of Ole Miss. Mm. Uh, So I didn't get a company there. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to say. Yeah. Um, And I I decided, well, I'm going to. I'm going to leave and I'm going to go try to go to Germany and see if I can get one there. Mm -hmm. And if I can't get one there, then it's probably time for me to leave the military. Mm -hmm. And so I came to Germany going, okay, I'm here for one reason and one reason only. I want to command a company. And if I have my choice, I realize I may not have my choice. I want to command a non-divisional maintenance company because it at the time was the largest company in my branch that the army had. And I felt like if I was going to do this and prove to myself as much as anyone else. And, you know, unfortunately, as a woman and a woman of color, I had to prove to everybody that I could do it. Mm. And if I was going to do that, I needed to take the biggest, hardest, most uh, complicated company they had and say, I'm going to command it for 18 months and I'm going to do it well. Yeah. And so that's what I was looking for. I got to the my new unit. I told the colonel there. 
that almost that exact same thing. He said, you don't always get a choice. I said, I realize that, sir, but given the choice, that's what I'm going to be looking for. And he said, well, I only have one requirement is that you serve me for at least one year before you look. Uh -huh. Now, Germany's a three-year tour. That's okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. good with that. You know, no yeah. problem. So about, um, I'd say, six to eight months into my time there, I realized, okay, it's probably time to start looking for a command. Uh -huh. And they had had a promotion um, uh, board. And a number of people didn't make the next rank. And a lot of the times it was because they didn't have that job that they needed, that company commander job. And so the command structure in Germany decided they were going to make sure that their captains had an opportunity to command. And so there was that interest at a higher level, a general officer level. Mm -hmm. And I did everything by the book when I uh, decided, okay, let me go out and look for those that particular company that I was looking for. I will ask permission because mm -hmm. at the time it wasn't in our command. Mm -hmm. So I went to my boss and said, I would like to go I've, and put my a military resume, if you will, a letter mm -hmm. and send my military resume over to this command to see if they'll accept me or interview mm -hmm. me for command. Will I be permitted to leave? Mm -hmm. He went and asked the bosses that be, and we got permission. I got an interview and I got accepted. So that company was perfect, right? The company, yeah. the big company I wanted to accept it was in a different command. And so when I came back with my letter of acceptance, uh -huh. um, the same colonel who said, all I ask is that you wait for a year. And by the way, I wouldn't have left until the year mark. Right. Um, said, well, not so fast. Uh -huh. I'm like, not so fast. Wait a minute. Uh -huh. You know, I, uh -huh. I did everything you told me to do. What's uh -huh. going on here? And um, he said, well, I've decided I wanted to make you my HH, my headquarters company commander. Now, traditionally, headquarters company commanders are uh, women. It's the smallest company. You're basically in charge of all the the people who outrank you. Yeah. In a company, so you're like an, a a caregiver. You you. Yeah. It's not like you have soldiers. You yeah. do have a few, but yeah. you're in charge of the colonels and the majors and everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. And they they tend to give those kind of commands, at least back then, to women. Uh huh. And I I didn't even say it was like a women's command, but I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. I got a choice to to command 250 plus soldiers uh -huh. versus 100. Uh huh. Okay, and you told me, yeah. I did everything you told me to do. So yeah. I went back to the colonel and I said, with all due respect, sir. And, and oh, by the way, he had not officially told me he wanted me to command that yet. Uh -huh. But I had this letter of acceptance saying, hey, can yeah. I leave? And I went back and I said, you know, sir, I'd really like you to reconsider. I said, I understand that you're you're not forwarding my letter to let me leave. Uh -huh. Um, You know, when I came here, this is the conversation we had. I think I've done everything by the book. I didn't go behind your back. I asked permission. You knew I was going to go interview. Yeah. Can yes. I please leave and go take this company? And he said, I haven't decided yet. Mm. Well, meanwhile, I had an interview for another, that same type of company within our command. Uh -huh. And the person who was a battalion commander I had served with in Korea. So I knew him uh -huh. and he was a good guy. And I thought, okay, maybe I can use this interview instead of like interviewing for the job. I could get some mentoring. Like, how do I get out of this? Yeah. How, do, how do I talk to this Colonel and help him yeah. understand what I really need for my career? So I went and I, I went to this Lieutenant Colonel and um, sat down and I said, listen, I'm not, I, I kind of came under false pretenses. I know you want to interview me for your command, but I really need some help. I need some mentoring and I trust you. And you're not exactly in my chain of command. So this makes it a little easier for me to talk to you openly. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I gave him the whole thing and I explained to him, look, I think this guy is going to order me to stay. And I said, that's just like, why am I here? I came here specifically to do this. Uh -huh. It's not like I went behind his back. And now he's, I'm like settling, settling for second best. And uh -huh. he gave me a really interesting um, thing that day. He said, close your eyes for a second. Think of a car. He said, when you just thought of a car, what did you think of? What kind, what make and model of it? And what color was it? And I told him, and he said, yeah, I thought of a different color and a different make and model. He said, when you thought of a car, the, he said, now if I told you to close your eyes and think of a company command, what would you think of? And I said, well, obviously, you know, yeah. this type of company. And he said, okay. He said, I have that kind of company. Now I'm thinking, oh, no, now I got two companies. Now I'm really in trouble. You know? uh -huh. Uh -huh. And he said, and I'm in, he said, you don't have to change commands for my company. He said, uh -huh. 
I'm I'm submitting your name uh-huh. and we'll let the general decide whether or not you leave. Uh-huh. And I'm like, oh no, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I go back, I tell my boss what happened. He said, okay, well, um, he knows you had the, the, the colonel knows you had an interview with this other current lieutenant colonel. So we'll just see what happens. And so um I was summoned downstairs and he said, you're going to be my HHC company commander. And I said, well, wait a minute, sir. Can we like talk about this? You know, maybe because, you know, I'm a woman. I yeah. need to yeah. prove. I mean, you know how desperately this is, how important yeah. this is. And he said, I don't think you heard me. This was an order. Well, you know, that's kind of a hard thing to give an order for when you're talking yeah. about somebody's life. I and mean, we're not talking to take that hill or save yeah. a person. We're talking about yeah. my life and my career. And I said, well, sir, with all due respect, I'm, I don't know that that's a good order. Um, I'd like to go see General Wilson, who is the next level up mm. on his open door policy, because I'm not sure that's what you should be giving me an order about when it concerns my life and my career. And he said, you either do what I told you or you resign. Mm. Now, things have been getting a little tense for the previous two weeks up into uh-huh. leading up into this. And so I had already decided, you know what? If this is what I have to do, I'm probably going to leave the army. I'd call my parents back in Brooklyn, and told them I may be coming home. This is not going well. And they knew yeah. I went to Germany specifically to command. And so I wrote out my letter of resignation like two weeks yeah. earlier. I let my boss, my immediate boss, see it uh-huh. um, and tweak it. And so when he told me that either I did this or resign, I went upstairs to my office. I printed out the letter. I dated it. I signed it. And I brought it back downstairs. Mm-hmm. And said, "Okay, then I guess I'm gone." Uh-huh. Wow! And and what happened next was he got a little this this colonel got a little nervous because General Wilson that I mentioned was General Johnny E. Wilson. He's African American at that time, one star. He later went on to be a four star officer, and he was also an ordnance officer. Okay. Okay. Um, now between him and the general that was in charge was General Louis. He was the three star. Who was okay. a quartermaster officer. But General Wilson was this colonel's immediate boss. Okay. okay? So now he was going to have to explain to this black general <laughs> why he just yeah. gave this black young captain a do this or resign order. And more importantly, he told her she, he, she didn't have the right to come see him. The Army has a regulation on the open door policy. If you think that for it's almost like a whistleblower policy, uh-huh. you have the right as long as you go to your chain of command and say, I would like to go see the next commander in the chain of command to, to, to discuss. I have a problem. And I'd like to go see them on their open door policy. Then that lower commander does not have the right to tell you, you can't go see that commander. Wow. That's okay. Powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's an open, it's a whistleblower. If I have a problem, if, if one of my soldiers has a problem with me and I'm the commander, I'm in charge of everything. Who are you going to tell? Uh-huh. Okay. Well, the army said you have a right to go to see the next commander up Mm -hmm. and you don't have to tell me why you want to go see the commander. You just have to come in and say, I would like to see the next commander on their open door policy. And then, you know, you have to wait and get an appointment and do all the go through all the procedures. But I don't have the right to say, well, you can't go see them. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so the fact that he said that Mm -hmm. was a problem for him and he realized it. Yeah. And so then he quickly tried to get my resignation through. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, he tried to say that I um, had gone to see all of these. I, I had gone to the second commander. Remember remember that second commander I'd gone to yeah. to ask for yeah. advice from that I had gone to see him without his permission or knowledge. Mm-hmm. I had only done that after he told me he wanted me to be his company commander that I thought that having a HHD was beneath me and I was too good for it. And wow. that wasn't the kind of officer that they needed in the military. Right. Wow. So basically he lied because he mm-hmm. kind of sort of forgot that I had that dated letter of acceptance mm-hmm. from the other company out, outside of the command. Yeah. Sitting in my hip pocket. Yeah. Okay. And so um, my resignation went through mm-hmm. and this guy, this unknown officer I mentioned, was sitting in personnel and uh-huh. he gets my resignation and he goes something wait a minute yeah. isn't her name on this other letter and meanwhile the other command 
had yeah. sent a letter to 21st Taycom yeah. and saying, hey, we can you release her? Because we want her to be a company commander. Uh -huh. So this one yeah. officer was like the nexus of all this personnel stuff. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean you're resigning? Yeah. I've got two commanders wanting you to be their commander. Yeah. And now I've got this letter of resignation that yeah. Colonel so-and-so is pushing through. Yeah. What's going on here? Something's yeah. wrong. Something's not right with this picture. Yeah. And he said, I've told General Louie, that's the three-star general, three-star, uh -huh. that something's wrong. We probably need to do a little bit more digging than this. He said, so I need you to tell me everything that's going on. So I told him. Uh -huh. He went in, and then I got another call about an hour later. And he said, let me see if I got this right. He told you to write this resignation letter or resign. Yes. He, you asked to go see General Wilson on open door. Yes, sir. Did anyone know that? Yes, sir, because I went to my boss and asked permission to go see Colonel, you know, so and so. I'm not gonna name his name in case he's out uh -huh. there. Um, you know, uh, I went to and asked to see him and he said, Okay, and your boss would be willing to say that? I said, I think he would. I said he stood by me. As a matter of fact, I told him to back away because he's a good guy and he's been standing by me and uh -huh. I didn't want his career to be tainted by any of this. Uh -huh. He said, Okay, got it. And the uh, the next day I got a call from General Wilson's office. Mm. remember the black one star yeah <laughs> <laughs> telling me to report to general wilson that following day at eight o'clock in the morning wow and i'm thinking i'm about to get my butt chewed out yeah. how dare i you know yeah. oh this. my god yeah and and his office was a three-hour drive on the autobahn which has no speed limits uh <laughs> from where we were located so the whole way there i'm just thinking i'm i don't even know what i'm gonna say to this general who i'd never met before yeah. I'm like, I, oh, good Lord, I'm going to, you know, he's probably going to just put me at the position of attention and that's going to be, I'm just going to get reamed. Yeah. So I got there, I reported, I went up to his desk, I salute, I report, you know, reporting his order, sir. And he looked up and he said, well, Carter, I guess you're probably wondering why I brought you here for this little father-daughter chat. Uh -huh. And I'm still saluting because he hasn't returned yeah. my salute yet. Yeah. And I'm thinking, father-daughter chat? Mm -hmm. oh okay maybe this isn't going quite the way i thought it was gonna go and so he saluted he came in he said come here sit down and he sat me down in his office and we had a little chat he said now i got your letter of resignation he said it's sitting over there on my desk now if you want to call jesse jackson or something you can call and complain against me he mm -hmm. said but i haven't quite decided what i'm going to do with it because general louis gave it to me to handle uh -huh. he said but i want to hear from you uh -huh. tell me about what happened and so he spent about 45 minutes with me. He one he let me tell my side the whole story yeah. of what happened. Uh -huh. He said, Now, what makes you think you need to have this other command? And I said, Well, sir, realistically, I said, You're a black officer. Obviously, you've done well. You're a general officer. Uh -huh. You know that we're going to be challenged. And I said, I felt like after what happened to me at the previous location, I needed to prove to myself I could do this. I needed to prove to the army I could do this. And I, so I chose the largest company there was and said, that's the one I'm going after. And I said, and I was upfront and honest. And yeah. I said, I felt like I did everything I was supposed to do. And I was still being told no. Yeah. Wow. And and I said, and, it, and it's really subjective. It, I said, yeah. it wasn't even like in the order of he, he made it sound like, like he yeah. offered me something. And then I went around and said, no, I got, I did everything right. And yeah. I'm still being slapped down. I don't, I said, I if that's what the army is. I said, mm -hmm. if that's what the army is really is, I said, I'm wasting my time. Yeah. I said, I'm not saying I'm too good for the army or anything. I said, but I just, this doesn't seem right. Yeah. And he said, what if I decide to make, give you the HHC? And I said to him, you've spent more time with me mm -hmm. and my boss, you know, the Colonel did throughout. The, I said, you actually sat me down and talked to me. I said, that's more than he's done mm -hmm. with me the entire time this has been going on. I said, I'm going to honestly tell you, I'm not sure I still wouldn't resign, but I'd have to give it a lot of thought mm -hmm. because I know that at least you gave it some thought. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, you'll know my decision tomorrow. Wow. This month. And the next morning, uh, my boss was standing in the hallway waiting for me and I got there early. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, what's going on? He said, uh, we've been summoned down to the Colonel's office. Uh, okay. Right. We go down to the, the two of us go down into the colonel's office, uh -huh. and there is the colonel pacing, uh -huh. um, not look, ma not making eye contact. And he said, uh -huh. "Well, I've decided that when I told you that you should resign, take this command to resign, that 
I was wrong. Mm. Okay, and so you can have the five four planes coming. The other company. <laughs> yeah. The one that was within our command. Right. Yeah, and I said, thank you, sir. I appreciate your reconsideration. I saluted sharply and I left out. My boss, crazy West Pointer that he was, was going, man, I was waiting for you to say, what? What'd you say, sir? What'd you do? And I'm like, you, you can get away with that. I said, you're a yeah. white guy. I yeah. can't, I just, I'm going, yeah. I'm not going to. Yeah. I'm not going to make the waters yeah. any more murky than they are. Yeah. I'm just yeah. going to happily take this and get the heck up on out of here as quickly as possible. And uh, General Wilson called me about uh, three weeks later. I was already starting my change of command inventory mm -hmm. and just said, have you gotten your officer evaluation report, mm -hmm. my report card? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, sir. He said, did it look okay? I said, yes, sir, it did. He said, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Mm -hmm. Wow. He said, now don't, he said, now don't disappoint me. And I said, don't worry, sir. You won't have, to. Yeah, that, that's not going to be a problem for you. Wow. So wow. that was probably the most tumultuous uh, month and a half of my life in the military. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, again, didn't know. And literally, I had people in my chain of command avoiding being seen with me. Yeah. Because they didn't want that colonel to look out and see them chatting with me and thinking that they were taking my side or offering yeah. me advice. The yeah. only one that stood by me was my immediate supervisor. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll name him Major Tom Nunn. He went on to be Colonel Tom Nunn. Good guy yeah. who did the right thing for the right reasons. Wow. Now, that's the kind of stuff, you know, I can, as you were laying it out, it's this is clear in your mind. You know, you know, when we have challenges, many times we we pass over them, but it just gave so much instruction there. There's so many lessons there to hang in there, to follow the rules, to go along, and then always see the good in it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. And, and, and you know, if you know you're right and you know something's not in your heart, follow your heart. Uh, you, know, yeah. um, yeah. you know, I could have easily said, okay, I'll take the HHC, but that wasn't my, that wasn't why I was there. That wasn't yeah. why I had, you know, left someplace and moved uh, transatlantic cross country yeah. and transatlantic um i i needed to do this and i had a very successful command um at one point my company was 311 soldiers strong wow. uh, we go marching uh, on our compound in, in Mannheim, germany and there were uh, battalion commanders who thought we yeah. were a battalion they're like yeah. where's the battalion flag why am i only seeing a company guide on yeah and it's like yeah. oh that's the 512 maintenance company oh yeah they mm -hmm. are big aren't they yeah wow now, all of that now, you know, having been through all that, that you are uniquely prepared for politics. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Um, everything that has happened in my life, I believe, has happened for a reason. And to get me where I am now, um, wow. the fact that I'm a political science major, I have a master's. I, I had decided once I commanded, well, I'm going to get out. You know, mm -hmm. I'm done. I did what I needed to do. I'm out of here. And then they said, oh, wait, you know, you've been in long enough. They kept delaying the promotion board. And then I, I came up as being promotable. And then I realized, well, wait a minute. Now I have to do is wait till 20 years and I'll get a permanent paycheck. Uh -huh. Ooh, pension. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's different. And uh, the Army was downsizing and they had uh, started doing early retirements where you could retire at 15 years. I was like, yeah. oh. Yeah. wait a couple of years yeah and then the minute i got close to that point they changed it back to 20 so, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I, I was like yeah, i'm getting the permanent paycheck and the yeah. permanent health care and all that good yeah. stuff at this point in my life yeah. but you know you you make up your mind that you're going to do something and if you think you're doing it for the right reasons you know you have to know yourself and your values your worth yeah um i think we as um women in particular but we also, as people of color who've been subjugated for many, many years, sometimes we don't realize our worth, what, what yeah. we're capable of. Yeah. Uh, we accept jobs or pay that yeah. is less than someone else who may be not as well-educated, not as experienced, mm -hmm. and yet they're making $20,000 more than you are. Yeah. Um, and it's all about knowing who you are, what your worth is. Um, I've been in posi positions um, where since I've retired, where folks have questioned um, the position I was in. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, you know, why do you do this? And why do you do that? And this was actually asking me of, of a, a woman of color mm -hmm. who was a subordinate. She's like, 
well, you don't do this and you don't do this and you don't really hang out with us. And I said, well, I'm management. It would be inappropriate for me to hang out with you. Mm-hmm. I said, mm-hmm. but I'm, my door is always open. You can come in. I said, the fact that you're having this conversation with me like this means that, you know, I'm yeah. approachable. Yeah. And she's like, well, you know, other people, do, I said, well, let me ask you something. I said, let, let's keep it real. I said, you want to keep it real? Let's keep it real here for a minute, sis. I said, how, why haven't you said that? Have you gone into so-and-so's office or so-and-so's office? These were two white males who were my equivalent yeah. position. I said, have you asked them to come do these things with you? Mm. I said, because quite frankly, I said, I have more civilian education and mm. more military education than they do. Yeah. But you want me to be yeah. at this level when I'm actually at this level. Mm-hmm. And I can't be at that level. Yeah. And yeah. still expect the folks at this level to respect me. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so that's, I said, I, I know where I'm supposed to be and what yeah. I have to do. That doesn't mean I'm not looking out for my people. Doesn't mean yeah. I'm not approachable to everyone. But you got to know yourself and your worth and and. I hate to use the term because it's usually used in a derogatory place, but I know my place. Yeah. I know in a good sense what my place yeah, is, where I'm supposed yeah. to be. Yeah. And and how I'm supposed to be treated. And and that's really one of the great, really, blessings of life. Once you figure that out, then everything else, you at least have a frame of reference to look at everything else. Yeah. Wow. So how, so how do you like politics and, and where do you see that going? Oh my goodness. Um, it depends on the day. Sometimes <laughs> the hour. <laughs> uh, we're, in, yeah. we're in the middle of budget season right now. I'm not sure it's a good time to ask. Um, yeah. I, you know what? I, I didn't do this to be a higher ranking politician. I, I love being at where I think the rubber meets the road for politics, being at the mm. local level. Um, yeah. It reminds me almost of being a platoon leader in the army. Like I have instant gratification, you yeah. know, people, you want a pothole fix? We can get a pothole fix. Yeah. Uh, people want more policing. We can get more policing. People want a change in uh, the culture. We can do those things. Yeah. And so this is a level of politics where you know I can still walk into the Piggly Wiggly or the Harris Teeter or the Walmart here, and people can approach me and ask questions. Yeah. Um, if I'm in Raleigh or I'm God forbid in D.C. or stuff, something that's yeah. usually you know I may never ever see. Uh, the true outcome of something I've worked really hard on. Here, yeah. that's not necessarily the case. So I, mm. I like this. I like being home. I like doing things for my neighbors, um, and being the representative for my neighbors. Hopefully, yeah. I think hopefully they still feel that way. Yeah. Um, you know, we may not always agree, but as I've told them, I'll always be truthful, and I hopefully will always be approachable, and um, we can agree to disagree. Wow. Wow. Well, you have had such a career. I, I tell you, Veronica, and I'm glad we took the time to go into it because, you know, ROTC has been, so many of my friends over the years, that has been a way to really take them to that next level. A lot of times you graduate from college and you still don't know what you're doing or where you're going. And to have that sort of predefined direction can be very helpful. I've had some friends who, that was the the turning point in their lives and so yeah yeah Yeah, i think if you had given me a choice um of of branches i would not have picked ordinance they gave me a choice i did not pick ordinance it was selected for me i'm Uh, glad i never ever would have thought of doing logistics but i'm i'm very pleased with what happened obviously um you know good lord knew best and Mm -hmm. and put me where i was supposed to be to get me ready i you know we have a very robust budget in our town Mm -hmm. our little town right now but i have managed personally managed budgets that were five times what we currently have at least five times Uh, when i was at company when i was at young company commander that i fought so hard for my budget was 138 million dollars and that was in 1987. wow um and so you know that was remember i said we had to have supply parts you had to have repair parts to to fix things yeah um yeah we fix things like m1 tanks we fix uh uh, microwave vans. We fix things that were very expensive. I have um, managed supplies, managed to get supplies from uh, the United States to Korea overnight. Uh, Apache uh, engines that Gosh. were worth, yeah. you know, yeah, Apache yeah. engines that were worth, you know, half a million dollars. I've gone on to, when I retired from the Army, I worked for the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operations as a logistics mm-hmm. officer. And yeah. I've managed to get logistics sent from our warehouse in 
uh, Brindisi, Italy to war torn countries in Africa. Wow. Um, so those are all things that are like instant wow. gratification. Yeah. And excuse me, let me uh, fix that. We're going to stop for a second here. My mute. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, forgot to turn that phone off there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've been able to to do things that I never ever would have dreamed or imagined if it hadn't been for the army, and mm. um, uh, you know, being able to look at future voters and say things like, "I know how government works. I've been in government." Uh, yes, it's the federal government. You know, when I left uh, the UN, I came here and I worked in the federal government. Yeah, uh, I worked at both as a federal employee and I worked as a, a consultant and contractor for the federal employee. Yeah. I've worked with state governments before. Um, I have the public administration background academically. I have the political science background as an undergraduate. And so all these things, knowing how to write a budget, manage a budget, um, execute a budget, mm. go through audits, um, uh, be responsible for the, the public trust. Yeah. When it comes to finances and when it comes to resources, uh, taking care of people, understanding human resources, both from a military. When, the other good thing about being a logistician in the military is you actually have the Department of the Army civilians work with you and for you. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And so I've had a boss when I was in, uh, a military person. I had a boss who was a civilian, a Department of the Army civilian. I've had civilians work for me when I was in the military and had to. Wow. So that helped me learn, frankly, how to get hired and fired in the federal government. So it was kind of yeah. get a yeah. federal job when I got out. Um, I so those, yeah. those are all things that are, you know, I wouldn't have planned it that way, but Worked there was out. a plan. There was a plan, a, t a little uh, pathway that I was being led down. Yeah. And I think it was all for a reason. Well, you know, you know, as you've been talking, I don't know that you could get that type of, you know, education, the logistics and all those things. It's almost like you've been putting it together over your entire life to bring mm -hmm. you to a certain point. And I think that you're, you, you may be surprised, but your political career is just beginning because, <laughs> because, <Okay>. yeah, <laughs> I mean, you have the, the people who really begin to, you know, sometimes you like say people who don't understand move to the top just by sheer force of will. But when you're competent, when you really understand all the moving parts and all those things, so so many times, you know, working with different politicians, so many times politicians are so far over their heads. You know, it's like when you get a a a, a three hundred page budget, <laughs> you know, and you and you still really have. Your biggest budget is taking care of your mortgage and balancing your checkbook, you know. So when you can have that type of background to look at something like that, you're going to be a definite asset and uh, good things will happen. Well, you know, at this point in my life and career, um, I'm happy just to uh, be blessed where I'm, I'm comfortable in living. And that's an advantage. Um, I, I think the fact that I don't have to work and can basically um, do what I want to do and say what I want to say yeah. is a definite advantage. Um, I like to say that my tolerance for nonsense is not existent right now. You know, when you're working right. and you're worried about a job or, you know, how am I going to pay this bill? You put up with a lot of stuff you normally would put up with. Uh, yeah. yeah. And we, we're not, but I'm not, I'm not playing. I'm too old for that. And I'm not playing it. And I don't have to play it anymore. And that's a wonderful feeling. It's very liberating. Um, but, you know, I'm just here trying. I've been blessed. I believe that when you've been blessed, you're supposed to be a blessing for someone mm -hmm. else. Yeah. And so I'm trying to give back. Um, I was taught that you help people. Um, my, I'm a first generation college graduate. My mother and father, did, they graduated from high school, but did not graduate from college. And in my mother's side of the family, I'm the first college graduate on that side of the family. And so I felt like I have a responsibility to, to help people. Not yeah. everyone is as blessed. My mother was brilliant. Now, she wasn't just wise, but she was actually very, very smart. She mm -hmm. became um, an assistant bookkeeper wow. and she very easily could have been a CPA. Wow. Um, she, she just had a, a knack for numbers right. and investments, and um, right. she just didn't have the opportunities that she right. made sure I had and right. enjoyed. Wow. And she, she used to teach me, you know, um, 
I, I jokingly say that don't let that little piece of paper go to your head, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't don't get all carried away. I remember yeah. um, I had a relative who my mother and some relatives went to their graduation, uh -huh. and um, and so at the I don't know what happened. I wasn't even there. I was still in the military. Uh -huh. Um, and I had and at this point I'd graduated from high, uh college like years years earlier. I already had my master's degree, and I suddenly got this call from my mother. Let me tell you something. Don't you ever think that that little piece of paper? I'm like, whoa, whoa, go time out. What happened? Yeah. You know what happened? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm like, you know, are you kidding me? And she said, well, um, the problem is that, that you know, some people get these pieces. I'm like, mom, when have I ever, ever like been snooty or, uh, you know, kind of sending to anybody just uh, because I have a college degree? And she's, well, I'm just telling you, don't uh, let that happen. Because if I hear about it, I'm like, mom, what happened? Uh -huh. Well, apparently this relative um, had made a comment that now that she had a degree, she would only hang out with professional people. Wow. And yeah. my mother and her her relatives kind of looked yeah. at each other because they were yeah. all high school graduates. Like, well, yeah. I guess that leaves all of us out. Yeah. <laughs> and my mother came home and I got the brunt of it. And I'm like thinking, whoa, yeah. Yeah. You know, time out. I never did that. Stop, stop. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I really, I'm, I'm mindful of that. I know that, you know, if I can help someone, who maybe doesn't understand something. Uh, many yeah. times I would get uh, something. When, once the, the post office started doing express mail, I get these packages from my mother uh -huh. that were express mail and it have a note in it, call me Sunday at this time. Okay. okay. And I could be in Germany or Korea. Uh -huh. or so yeah. I got to go find a phone. You know, this is the eighties and the nineties. It wasn't like, you know, cell phones with SIM cards. And yeah. I'd be calling my mother and, and I'm like, okay. She's like, well, did you? And, it, and I opened up, it was a prospectus for yeah. stock or a mutual fund. Yeah, yeah. What the heck is my mother doing? Uh -huh. So uh, I, I, she said, well, did you read through what I sent you? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think of it? <laughs> like, okay. Um, uh -huh. I think it's, oh, what are you, are you investing in the stock market? And she goes, I think so. I think, you know, I was talking to our banker. <laughs> and so right. I didn't realize for a long time how much money my mother had stocked, stocked away yeah. um, until she passed away. And then my father said, I think you need to take over the money, yeah. you know, because my mother did everything. And then I was like, whoa, yeah. OK, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, she'd done quite, yeah, she'd done quite well. But she uh -huh. used to like take things that she thought she understood because a lot of times, you know, this you're a lawyer. A lot of yeah. times stuff, contracts and things are written in legalese. Yeah. That just, uh, you know, even people with degrees look at it and go, what the heck are yeah. they trying to say? Yeah. So I got really good at translating from my parents. Like they would mm. send me stuff and I am I just thought of it as, well, you know what? They yeah. paid for the degree. They should get their yeah. money's worth. Okay. Yeah. Wherever yeah. they were in the world, <laughs> okay. yeah. you can translate for you. Fine. I can do that. Yeah. Well, it turns out that's actually a good skill to have Yeah. because yeah. as I fight things like environmental justice, a yeah. lot of times we'll get in a room with a bunch of scientists or a bunch of um, administrators in the federal agencies or state agencies, and they'll say things, and I'll look around, and I'll see folks not really wanting to admit that they really weren't sure what they said, yeah. or these folks are talking in acronyms, or they're talking at like they're talking to a peer-reviewed journal article or something, and I'll raise my hand and say, excuse me, let me yeah. just, let me, let me just see if I understood what you said, yeah. and I'll repeat it back to them as if I was talking to my parents, like, let yeah. me see, did you just say, and yeah. I'll give it back to them kind of in straight English. And afterwards, people will walk up to me and say, thank you. Oh, you know, bless you for being there and doing yeah. that. Because I wasn't yeah. sure I understood. And so, I, you know, again, as I've gotten older and allegedly wiser, I realized, okay, all of the things that's happened in my life have happened so that I could be yeah. right where I am right now, now. Wow. that I'm doing. And yeah. so that that's cost me anything. Yeah. That's you know? perfect. Well, you know, when you look back now that you've like sort of put it all together and you look back to the young lady who was coming out of Samuel Tilden and getting ready to go into college, what advice would you give your younger self? Ooh, ooh, that's a good one. Um, don't be afraid. Mm. Don't be afraid. Go for it. Um, I, 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 my mother always said not everybody is as strong as me, but there were many times I didn't do something. Um, and I, I think I sometimes, re I wonder, 
um, hopefully with not too much regret. As I got older, I, I started stepping out in faith and doing a lot more. But there, in my younger self, I think sometimes probably because I didn't have those mentors there, you know, my yeah. parents hadn't experienced it. I had one mentor who's my godfather, um, great guy. His name is Ronald Moss. He went to high school with my mother in West Virginia. And because he had gone to college, was uh, worked for the federal government and was Army ROTC, turns out, as, as you know, divine intervention would have it. He was a guy I could go to and, and talk to and ask questions of and kind of use as a sounding board for things that yeah. maybe my parents just didn't have the, the the experience base. They were wise, but they just didn't have that experience of this is what happens in college or this is what happens in the army, that kind mm. of thing. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have as much of that as um, there exists now for yeah. folks. And I wish sometimes they were... You know, there were a couple of bosses that that guy from Ole Miss. I wish I I dealt with him differently. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I I wish that I had challenged him. Obviously, when I challenged the second guy who took me on, yeah. and I just said, "Well, I, I'm you know what you yeah. want to you want to you want me to do this? Fine, yeah. I'm gonna. Yeah. I don't yeah. care anymore. I'll just leave. Yeah, it all worked out. What have I done that with the first guy? Yeah, yeah. I'll never know. And yeah. could I have prevented him? I'm sure he went on to 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 mess with other people's lives and careers. Yeah, yeah. Um, could I have prevented that if mm. I'd stepped up? And so those are things that um, I sometimes wonder about. And I guess I could look back on re with regret, but I just didn't know. And there was no one to teach me at the time. Wow. And, you know, you know, Veronica, that is so critical. So many times that one person, like you say, that who can give you that that outside of the box guidance that experiential guidance you know who've been where you're trying to go you know who understand the game so uh, that's powerful the support uh, yeah let's yeah. be there you no know, just yeah. like that that one lieutenant colonel who stepped up and said hey i'm about to take this in because something's yeah. not right yeah that one person can make a difference in somebody's life well you know many times we do things like you said to don't be afraid as a younger person that many times we don't know the outcome. We don't. We don't see all the. We just say, "Hey, this is what my rudder. If if my, if my life is a ship, this is what my rudder tells me is mm -hmm. the right thing to do. The steer left, steer right to do this." And then it seems that once you take that position, then the world, the universe, massages it. If you didn't take the position, the the fellow would have never seen it. And a whole nother course of events that have happened. And so yes. that that really, you know, just for our younger yes. for people listening, younger and older people, that when you do what you think is right, then the universe can sort of don't worry about how. The universe will confirm. You didn't put no, the letter no, no, no. out it, there. Yeah, to to Yeah, to if create. you're sticking up for what your values and what you think is the right thing to do, you know, I guess the one rank in the military that I learned the most from was Sergeant Major. Um, we had a, a black sergeant major when I was an Army ROTC cadet, mm -hmm. uh, Charlie E. English. And uh, the women that were in our ROTC program were about the same age as his daughters. Uh -huh. And so he literally took us under his wing like daughters yeah. and made sure that we had that mentor there. And so I always kind of had a certain special spot in my heart for sergeant major, sergeant major, uh -huh. um, that they were the older, wiser, you know, remember the old 1970s Kung Fu where you had Master Poe and Grasshopper? Yeah. yeah they were, yeah. they were the Master Poe and you were the young Grasshopper yeah, trying talking. to go, Master, tell me the, the how, yeah. and I've, I've done things like that with, with yeah. a certain, certain, uh, sergeant's major and said things like, you know, how do I be, what, what does it take to be a good officer? I'll never forget yeah. one of them yeah. who um, I really had a lot of respect for, Sergeant Major Muscovich. We were sitting there one day and I said, Sergeant Major, what does it take to be a good officer? And he said, never walk past the mistake. Ooh. And I said, what do you mean? Uh -huh. He said, if you know something's wrong, he said, if you, he said, all the time I see officers, particularly young officers, uh -huh. um, they'll, they'll walk and a, a, a junior officer or a junior enlisted person won't salute them. And instead of stopping them on the spot and correcting them, uh -huh. they'll let it go. They'll uh -huh. walk past it. He said, or they'll see something's out of place and they won't stop and fix it. He said, never walk past a mistake. Because Ooh. once you let that mistake go, uh -huh. then it becomes okay. Then it becomes uh -huh. a rule. It becomes, you know, yeah. it's okay to do it. You've gotten away with it. Right. And he said, so never walk past a mistake. And I've never forgotten that. Um, he he was full of little one-liners like that, uh -huh. you know? yeah. And that one has always stuck with me. Wow. That 
you know, if you see something's wrong, fix it then. Wow. That's, uh, you know, now that's powerful. Never walk past a mistake. I, I tell you, I loved, I've done so many interviews and I was in the learning mode. I'm always taking notes because people have such wisdom that, that, that like people have wisdom they don't even know they have sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that was powerful. Well, I, I guess I have two more questions because we've gone, you know, one of the things I find is that, I, you know, a lot of times when people do podcasts and interviews, they have like a time limit. And I did that for three years. And then I went to one day, I'm like, one day I, I just decided not to. <laughs> and the, the quality of the interview changes, you know, it's it's really a conversation rather than an interview, you know, and okay. so, so many other things come out. As you look down, you know, like right now, you seem to be at such a, a like just a balanced place in your life. Mm -hmm. If you look down 25 years down the line, what, did give, what advice from 25 years would you give your present self? Uh, future or past? 25 years future. in the future? Yeah, in the future. Probably be dead. So, um, <laughs> uh, um, if I'm if I'm still here, uh -huh. probably say take, take better care of yourself. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I I kind of I think I am in a balanced place in my life, and um, I I like to think I've learned a lot of lessons. Mm -hmm. Um, and I walked, I, I, I have walked past some mistakes, but I'm trying to, to rectify those now and, mm -hmm. and trying to, to, and, um, share some of those lessons with folks as I go through life. And so I, I want to live my life, but what's left of it in a way where there aren't as many regrets as there were when I was younger mm -hmm. that I don't say, gee, I wish I had done this, or I wish I had done that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'm doing that now. Um, it, it's sometimes difficult. It's still a challenge sometimes to take that first step, that leap of faith. Um, yes. but, um, I, I think I'm in a better position mentally, emotionally, fiscally, uh, uh, that, that it's not as challenging or scary as it once was. And so I don't know 25, I just hope 25 years from now, when I'm still alive and in my right mind mm -hmm. and that, um, I, again, I can sit back and go, okay, that was a good ride. Yeah. You know, if I, if I had to end it, if I knew tomorrow was it for me and this was the last day, I uh, can honestly look back and say, you know yeah. what? It was a great ride. I, yeah. there, I have seen things and done things that I never, ever would have imagined as that little pigtail little girl going to PS 91. Wow. Um, you know, so I've got no regrets in anything wow. that's happened. Now, let me tell you, that's powerful. To live, it no is. Regrets. That's powerful. It really is. I mean, yeah. I know I've made mistakes, and and mm -hmm. like we said, there are things I maybe I should have done differently, but I can't go back and change them. So I'm not gonna fret over them. I'm just yeah. gonna hopefully learn learn whatever I can from it, and yeah. move forward. And if I can't fix it, maybe I can prevent somebody else from making the same mistake. Yes. Wow. Um, wow. So that's, that's it. Well, Veronica, this has been. I have enjoyed this interview. I have learned so much. And I thank you so much for sharing from your heart, really. I mean, because there's this one thing, anybody listening is going to feel your heart speaking. And uh, you know what? I don't know any other way to be. I, I I look at some people, and I know there are people who who have other faces. That's something else I learned. You, you got to be yourself. It yeah. takes too much energy to to try to be anyone else or try to please anyone else. Just um. I, I joke sometimes with people because they say, well, don't you, you know, you, you're alone a lot. Or I said, I like me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm an only yeah. child. Yeah. I have no yeah. siblings, you know, yeah. I'm yeah. of course. Unfortunately, I have no kids. So yeah. yeah, I've learned to like me. I think I'm a nice person. I can get along yeah. well with me, you know, wow. wow. I can entertain myself quite well. Um, yeah. Or I can call, I have friends I can call yeah. from 30 wow. and 40 and 50 years ago. So, yeah. you know, um, I think you just have to be able to get to that place, whatever it takes to get to that place where you like you yes, and, you, and you're comfortable with you wherever you are in life. You know, you yes. may not have a lot of material things, mm. and, but you don't really need them. You just need to be comfortable. You need to wow. be happy. Yes. Well, I tell you, today, I think we have, well, I guess to me, I, I always like to close an interview. I said, well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Because. <laughs> I think I think I've said enough for now. 
Um, again, if, if folks just go, I will say one thing. I want everybody to vote. Uh, and that's that's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Um, I remember being a little girl watching the attack dogs, the German shepherds and uh, the fire hoses of people. Um, our parents and grandparents and great grandparents fought too hard. One of the best things I found on Ancestry DNA was a voter registration card from like a great great grandfather in the 1900s who literally had his mark as his, his signature for his voter registration card. But there he was in Chambers, Alabama voting. And I was so proud of that. Like, wow. wow. You know, yeah. even yeah. then my family was like doing what they were supposed to do. Wow. Um, go vote. Um, that's you don't complain if you don't vote. And don't vote every four years or two years. Yes. Every election is important. Yes. Every you yes. know, too many people yes. have fought too long and too hard for just to get us where we are now. And we're not where we could be or should yes. be. Yes. We still have a way to go, but we're not gonna get there sitting at home. Wow. So I'll leave you with go vote. Go vote. You don't have to you don't have to vote for me. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, I don't care yeah. who you vote for. Well, I mean, maybe I do. But yeah. you know, just go vote. Do your homework. Do your My homework. My fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Senner, said. Don't look at your neighbor's paper because they're probably wrong too. Okay. <laughs> do your own work, do your own research and go vote because every single election is important. Exactly. Well, Veronica, thank you so much for an incredible interview for the insight to our listeners. This has been a special, special interview. And one of the reasons that I really took some extra time is because the nuggets that Veronica, that the office of Veronica, that the educator Veronica, that the person, that the lady, that the woman, that the black woman, the leader, that some of the things that she say, shared are literally nuggets that can change your life. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. And those of you who are listening to this interview in the future, listen to it two or three times because every time you hear it, you'll hear something new. When you can take the principles that you hear in these interviews, these, these really lifelong principles that have helped so many people, then you can truly be what you want to be, do what you want to do, and have anything you desire, always knowing that the best is yet to come. And so it is. Yes.